Need shotguns? We've got guns. In this video, you're gonna learn how to extend the scriptable object gun system to add shrapnel shooting shotguns. Not cool enough for you? How about a knockback effect as well? Yeah, I think that's cool too. Hey, Chris here from Mom Academy, here to help you. Who, me? Yes, you. Make your game dev dreams become reality by helping you implement a variety of different gun types in your game. Now, if this is the very first video in the gun series that you're watching, it's probably not gonna make a ton of sense because we're building on a lot of components that we built in one, two, and nine, and probably touching a few others. But don't despair. We'll be talking about how you can generally implement these same things, even if you're not using this full gun system. Here's what we're gonna do. Instead of shooting a single bullet whenever we left mouse button, we're gonna loop over a configurable number of bullets to shoot per shot. And we're gonna define that in the shoot config scriptable object and use it in the gun scriptable object. Two, shotguns aren't super accurate. So we need to make sure that we have a minimum amount of spread to apply. Right now, the default minimum spread is zero. So whenever we shoot our shotguns with eight pieces of shrapnel or whatever, those will all go perfectly straight, which is not what we want. We'll define that as well in the shoot config scriptable object. Once we've done that, we basically can shoot as many different bullets as we want and the shotgun effect is complete, but we don't just do the basics here. We're gonna also apply that knockback effect. And the knockback has three main components, the base force to apply to the object, the fall off curve, because if you're really far away, we probably don't wanna apply the knockback and the direction of the force to apply. We'll set up all of this configuration in a new knockback config scriptable object and handle the applying of the knockback using the eye collision handler. Once we have all of that, we can apply knockback to any objects that have the eye knockbackable interface that we'll make as well. We'll implement that in our enemy AI movement class, but we can also apply this to just arbitrary objects in the scene. So we can knock back like boxes or whatever else we wanna knock back because at the end of the day, it's just applying force to an object. Now, if you're ready, Let's go ahead and jump in and start implementing all this stuff. This is gonna be fun. The first thing we'll do is create our shotgun scriptable object. It's gonna be kind of similar to the M4. So instead of just creating all this from scratch, I'm just gonna copy paste the M4 and rename it shotgun. We'll change the gun type to shotgun, change the name to shotgun. We're gonna to have to make our own shotgun prefab. So we'll come back to this. Probably the spawn points of this are relatively okay. Ammo config is gonna to be totally different. So if we select none, our scriptable object creator here will allow us to create one directly from this object. We'll just create a shotgun ammo config. Most likely shotguns don't have that much ammo. So maybe six per clip before you have to reload. And we'll default the max ammo, that's fine. Damage config, probably gonna be very different. So we'll just create a shotgun damage config and maybe have it fade down over time. But remember, this only allows us to shoot one meter away. So maybe shotguns are relatively short range thing. So maybe we'll go down to damage zero at 10. Something like that maybe is a good starting point. Shoot config is going to be dramatically different. We're gonna shoot from the camera. Let's go ahead and use hit scan. I guess it doesn't make a big difference. Hit mask will be default enemy floor probably. And shotguns shoot relatively slow. So maybe we want something like half a second between shots. And we'll say we go very quickly to max spread time. Spread type simple, that's okay. We'll just reuse this trail config for now. We can mess with it later. Same with audio config and we'll use no bullet penetration. So cool, and just like a minute, we have a new done scriptable object set up. But we have a little bit of a problem with our shotgun. We need it to be able to shoot multiple bullets at a time. It's like a shrapnel shot. And right now we only shoot one bullet at a time. There's also going to be an issue with our spread range because we always shoot perfectly accurate on our first shot and then it starts spreading out. But shotguns never shoot perfectly straightforward. They always have kind of some spread going on. So that's the first challenge is updating our shoot config. So in our shoot config scriptable object, I think something important to add will be maybe a public int bullet per shot and set that to be one by default so we don't mess with any of the existing gun shooting. When we come down to our spread, we have simple spread, which is what we're gonna use today. The texture spread isn't always perfectly accurate based on what texture you provide, so that's okay. I think we're gonna need another public vector three min spread and set that to be vector three zero by default. That way we keep our existing functionality. Now, whenever we're going to get our spread, 
which previously all we did was alert between vector 3, 0 as our minimum and the maximum spread in this range. So over time, the longer we've been holding down mouse one, the more spread we apply and the closer to this really broad spread we get. So we might try alert between min spread and max spread, but remember we wanna go on the negative and positive of this. So we need basically the same thing here that we have for B as the first part, but using min spread instead of normal spread. Great, so now we have not always necessarily perfectly accurate shots. We need to also add that to our property drawer. We have a simple spread field. We can now do a min spread field, call that minimum spread. And anywhere we do anything with simple spread, we're gonna wanna do the minimum spread as well. And if you haven't been watching the full gun series, don't worry, I've got a link in the description to a video where we cover exactly how we make this property drawer. This is also totally not required. If you don't want to get into editor scripting right now, you can skip this whole section of the video and everything will still work perfectly. The point of this isn't really about the inspector. I just want to show that process in case you're following every single video. We want to bind the property to min spread. And importantly, we want to add it to our shoot config box. Otherwise it won't show up. And I'll add it first because then we'll go from minimum to maximum. We also added a bullet per shot. I think right around the time where we're adding in all this bullet prefab stuff is a good place to put that. I'll put it right below shoot type. We'll just create a new integer field, bullets per shot, give it that label, bullets per shot. We'll bind the property bullets per shot to this field and add it to the shoot big box. Nothing crazy going on here. Back in the Unity editor, we can now see bullets per shot defaulting to one. Since we're using the shotgun config, let's maybe make it shoot six bullets maybe per shot. In our minimum spread, maybe we can make it default to something like 0.1 and increase the max to like 0.15. Our minimum spread is already incorporated because we implemented that in a scriptable object, but our bullets per shot, we need to update the gun scriptable object to support this new field. We have this try to shoot function. That is where we actually do the shooting. And right here is where we actually perform shooting. We get the spread, we shoot in some direction, we offset the gun position a little bit, and then we either do a hit scan or a projectile shoot. Importantly, we also subtract ammo. So this whole segment, we wanna wrap with a for loop and go for int i equals zero. I lessen the shoot config bullets per shot and increment i by one. Importantly in here, we want to subtract the current clip ammo before this loop. Otherwise we'll use all of our ammo in that single shot, which is not what we're looking for for a shotgun. Now, it seems like it's easy enough. Let's try this out and see if it's working. Back over in the Unity editor, we can't just click play because we still are using the wrong gun and our loadout screen here isn't gonna work properly because we haven't hooked it up yet. So to make a new prefab, we first need a model. Luckily, Kenny and Casper from Kenny.nl provided all of these models that include a shotgun for us already. This model is a little bit small, so I think upgrading it to something like scale factor five might work a little bit better for us. If we just temporarily enable our player model, bring that shotgun in underneath the gun holder. Oh, well, five's too small, looks like. Seven might be better, let's try that. Now this is the little bit annoying part, remember? We have to find how does this look good underneath our player? And we also need to provide IK targets for our hands. I wanna show that whole process here in this video. You can go back to part one where I show exactly how to hook this up and aim and position it. So that way we can focus on specifically what we're trying to do in this video, which is make the shotgun. Once we've positioned all of our IK targets and added a muzzle flash to the tip of the gun, which is important, remember that, this system requires you have a particle system at the tip of the gun, we can create a prefab just by dragging this to our prefabs folder. We'll then use this in our scriptable object as our model. So we can go back to our guns, find our shotgun, and then drag our prefab to that model. The spawn point we have to update a little bit as well, as well as the spawn rotation. So I like to lock the inspector, add a second one, and then copy our values over. And then it's all trial and error from here to make sure that it actually looks good with your IK. Remember, we also need an audio source on our prefab. Our UI from the loadout also uses what we have set up on our player armature, the available guns. So we need to add in our gun here to our player gun selector, which is a demo script. And let's disable the player armature. You can delete the shotgun. We'll click play and check it out. On the loadout, we can make sure to select our shotgun, which now shows up. We'll not use any of the customization. Just click play and boom, we have a shotgun that shoots very inaccurately and in an unpredictable pattern. Great. If you recently watched the AI series part 51, you'll know that we did some knockback of some llamas. And I promised I'd talk about how do we do knockback here in this series as well. 
Some of this will be a little bit of a repeat from that video, but we're gonna go in depth about all the components of this. Now for a knockback, there's something really important that we talk about and that's the physics material. And my last video, I talked about these in depth. So if you don't know what a physics material is, go check out that video, I've got a link in the description and a card on the screen. I'm just gonna create these in the assets folder. Right now, we'll just right click, create physics material. We'll create one for the ground and we'll create one for our llamas. We're gonna want them to be easily knocked back. So we're gonna set static friction to zero and we want them to maybe glide a little bit. Knockback is usually not a super realistic effect. So we're gonna lower this dynamic friction down to something like 0.2 and maybe bounciness, something like 25%. The ground will have a small bounciness, a little bit less static friction and 0.6 dynamic friction. That's just the default. We'll leave everything else alone. The reason for that, the way this level is set up, this big structure has both walls and floors. So I want if they hit the wall to bounce off from it a little bit, which also means that our ground is going to be a little bit bouncy. You can create different meshes. So you use a floor on top and you wouldn't have to do it that way. So basically, we're going to change all the materials here that exist right now to use the ground physics material. So if we just search for mesh collider, we find all of these things. We're just going to change that material to the ground material. And we look for the rest of these, I think, have box colliders. We just look for box collider. We can assign again the ground material. I was originally planning to use these just cylinders, but there were some weird physics problems I was having there. So instead, we're going to replace these with a llama. Our llama here is hooked up with some stuff that we've talked about a bunch of times in the series already about. The important part is they have a capsule collider and we want to apply the llama material. To apply knockback, we need also the rigid body. So the way this system is going to work is they roam around using the nav mesh agent. Whenever they get hit by our knockback, what we're going to do is disable the nav mesh agent, flip the rigid body from is kinematic to false, enable gravity, and then apply force to this object. Whenever they've resolved that they're done being knocked back, we'll just inverse that, re-enable the nav mesh agent, and they'll continue on their way. We're now going to want our guns to potentially be able to knock back objects. That means we're going to want a new scriptal object, a knockback config scriptal object. This should be a scriptal object, and we need this create asset menu. We're going to want it to be called knockback config via the menu knockback config, and this is probably a pretty low priority item. We'll put it at eight. There's really three main things we need here. We need the strength of the knockback, which should be relative to the weights of the objects that you have in the scene. My llama is 75 kilos, which I think is kind of realistic. Not realistic for a pool toy llama, but for actual llama, probably pretty realistic. I don't know. We also want a distance fall off and a configuration for what's the maximum time we should wait before saying, hey, knockback is done. We want to also maybe make it easy for somebody to get the knockback strength. So we'll make a public vector three, get knockback strength, requiring that they send in the direction and the distance from the object. We're going to do the knockback strength times the distance fall off, evaluate it at the distance, and then multiply that by the direction. This gives us the distance fall off curve to manipulate the knockback strength. And then we apply that in the direction that was sent in. Remember that all of our scriptal objects need to be clonable. And we follow the same pattern on all the scriptal objects. We create a clone, new instance. Then we use utilities.copyValues, which uses reflection to copy the values from the current object to the clone, and then we return the clone. Then in our gun scriptable object, we want to add a reference to this thing, put it right below that bullet pen config, and all the way at the bottom, we want to make sure that whenever the gun scriptable object is cloned, it also clones this. Now, how do we want to handle knockback? Well, we already have this thing called the eye collision handler, which handles impact effects. And really knocking an enemy back is an impact effect of the bullet. Whenever the bullet makes impact, it would apply force to some object and try to knock it back. So we can create a new impact effect called knockback, which implements the eye collision handler. Because we get a reference to the gun, we can get a reference to the knockback config, but something's missing here on the eye collision handler. We don't have the distance traveled, which is important for the knockback. So let's add in the float distance here and also to the eye collision handler. Unfortunately, that means that we broke our current system because we added a new parameter to our interface. So we're gonna have to come in here to any of these places that are now underlined in red and fix that by adding in the float distance traveled to our functions here.
Once we've updated the frost in the abstract area of effect, we can go back to the gun script tool object, which in our handle bullet impact is where we call handle impact of the collision handlers. So we can just provide the distance traveled here because we already have it based on the handle bullet impact. If you're doing raycast, you get this from the raycast hit. And if you have a rigid body bullet, then you have to track where it spawned and where it made impact and then do a vector three distance to find out how much distance was traveled by that bullet before it made impact. We handle that on our bullet by just tracking where it was spawned from. So whenever on collision enter happens, we can do a vector three distance from the collision hit point and our spawn location. So we have our eye collision handler that needs to do something, but how do we know what we impacted can be knocked back? Well, we could check for a rigid body and try to just apply force, but remember that our AI is using a nav mesh agent and we can't just apply rigid body force to the rigid body because the nav mesh agent is what's driving it. In this case, I would recommend making an eye knockbackable interface. And here we probably need a void get knocked back vector three force and a float max move time. So we know what's the force that should be applied to my rigid body or whatever it is that we're gonna use. And how long should I wait before I just say, hey, I'm done being knocked back. Let's start resuming normal operations. I think it's also important that we have a public float still threshold. So anything that implements this needs to understand what's the minimum move of velocity before we should consider ourselves done moving. With that in mind, back in knockback, we can do if impacted object, try get component out, I knock backable, knock backable, knock backable dot get knocked back, providing the force being the gun knock back and fig get knocked back strength using the negative hit normal and the distance traveled. We want to use the negative hit normal because the hit normal is pointing in the opposite direction of the raycast or the bullet. We want to actually apply force to the object in the direction that the bullet was traveling, which is the negative hit normal. We also want to provide the gun knockback and big maximum knockback time. Now, the next interesting part is how do we know that we want to apply this knockback eye collision handler? In our gun scriptable object, we have already an array of zero items of bullet impact effects and modifiers may apply eye collision handlers. I think the safest way to do this is to check if the knockback config knockback strength is greater than zero. Then we can get the current collision handlers by doing eye collision handler array current handlers equal bullet impact effects. Then assign bullet impact effects to be a new eye collision handler with the current handlers length plus one copy from the current handlers to the new bullet impact effects array, which is one larger, copying the current handlers length number of items. Then at the very last one, we can do bullet impact effects indexed by caret one, which is a cool shorthand to get the last element in the array. Assign that to be a new knockback. So that's the same as doing bullet impact effects indexed by bullet impact effects dot length minus one equals new knockback. So far so good. Let's move on to the enemy movement where we will implement that eye knock backable because we want them to be able to be knocked back. Now for your game, it may be you're not using nav mesh agents. You may be doing something else. We'll talk about generalities of how do you apply this in case you're not using this specific enemy movement. We know we want to apply force using a rigid body. So let's say that this requires component type of rigid body. We'll add a class member variable for the rigid body and assign that on awake. Now what this AI does today is just on start, starts roaming around idly, picking random corners of the triangulation of the nav mesh, waiting until they're within stopping range, and then starting all over again, just picking random places to move to. They can be slowed down. That's not really important for what we're talking about with knockback. And that's pretty much it. So maybe what we can do here is make them implement the eye knockbackable. Move the property back to the top. and set the still threshold with a default of 0 0.01. Now, when we're gonna get knocked back, we wanna stop the movement from happening. We don't want them to be moving on the nav mesh agent anymore. So we have a start coroutine roam, but we can also potentially be slowed down that's using a coroutine. So we're gonna use the same pattern here. We'll create a private coroutine, move coroutine. And on start, where we start roaming, we'll say move coroutine equals start coroutine roam. Then all the way down here at the bottom with the get knocked back, we're going to want to stop that move coroutine and set the move coroutine to be start coroutine, apply knockback, providing the force and the max move time. Because applying the knockback is a multi-step process, we want to be able to encapsulate all that in a single coroutine. Let's go ahead and define that as a private IE numerator, apply knockback with a vector three force and a float max move time. 
I found it most of the time we want to wait one frame before we start applying the knockback because um, we can run into some weird issues when multiple coroutines are running. We can wait one frame with yield return null. Then we want to, as I was saying earlier, disable the nav mesh agent, turn gravity on, turn is kinematic off, and then apply the force. Now we're where the physics system is controlling this enemy AI because they're getting knocked back and we've applied that force. What we want to do is wait for the fixed update. If we don't wait for fixed update, sometimes that force we just applied isn't applied yet because the update loop and the fixed update loop run at different intervals. It's possible in this update we've applied the force, but it hasn't reflected yet in the physics system. We'll then assign a float knockback time to be time.time. .time and do a new yield return wait until passing in a delegate function with rigidbody.velocity.magnitude is less than still threshold or the time is greater than knockback time plus max move time. What wait until does is calls this delegate every frame until this returns true. So once we have applied that force, our velocity magnitude is going to be very large, which will be much larger than our still threshold, meaning that will return false. And in case we don't resolve down to below that still threshold before the max move time ends, this will return true with the second half of that. We can then give something like a quarter second delay, so that like they're stunned at the end of their movement, and then we want to do the inverse of what we did above. So we want to first reset the rigid body velocities, turn off use gravity and turn on is kinematic. Warp the nav mesh agent to the current position. So we've told the nav mesh agent, you've been moved outside the navigation system, understanding what's happening. You're now here. Then we'll enable the nav mesh agent. Wait one frame to make sure that everything's resolved. And then we can say we're going to start roaming again. The key piece you can see here is we're going to add force to a rigid body, ensuring that is kinematic is false, because having is kinematic as true tells the physics system that this thing moves on its own. Then we wait for some time until the physics system resolves that this thing has stopped moving, either by the magnitude being too small, meaning it's moving too slowly, or we clamped it to a maximum move time. Depending on how you have your AI working, maybe not using a mesh agent, but using something else, you'd follow the same process of turning off whatever you have that controls it, like the mesh agent, apply the force to the rigid body, wait for it to resolve that it's done being knocked back, optionally add in like a stun duration at the end, and then swap control back to whatever had control of the AI before. Four. We can also have very simple knockbackable objects such as boxes that look a little bit like this where we don't really care what happens after they get knocked back, they just get knocked back. Another fun piece that we can do with these is make them knock each other back. That way if an AI hits another object that is knockbackable, not just from the guns, but from just interactions like those boxes that are knockbackable, for example, shooting the llama into a box would also apply force to the box. We'll add a new class called knockback on collision, which will just acquire component type of collider. It's going to be a mono behavior. We can do on collision enter other dot transform dot try get component out I knockbackable knockbackable much like what we saw in the knockback impact effect and say knockbackable dot get knocked back. But for this one, how do we know the force? Well, on a collision, we have this cool property called the impulse. The impulse is basically the negative version of the force that was applied to this object. So if we use negative again, we're saying in the same direction that we were just going with the same force that was applied, push this object back. And we again need to have a max move time so we can provide one or maybe even better. We can add a serialized field, private float, max move time set to one by default and use that so we can configure this on a per object basis. Let's come back to the Unity editor and on our llamas, we can apply the knockback on collision. Since they already have the enemy movement script, it's not a lot we need to do here. Let's go select our gun scriptable object so we can set up our knockback config. Oops, we didn't update the editor to have the configuration for the knockback config yet. So let's do that really fast. Let's add another property field to our gun scriptable object editor to reference our knockback config. If we open up our gun script of object editor UXML, we can just copy paste the last property field and change the binding path to be our knockback config. And we can see that we also didn't create an editor yet for our knockback config scriptable object. I think this video is probably long enough already, and I have a couple of videos about making these editors already. So if you want to see this full implementation of how did I set up this property, check out those videos, which I've got links in the description and card on the screen for. You can also check out the full project on GitHub for free if you want to check out exactly the code that you see right here. Back in the Unity editor, we'll just make a folder for a knockback config scriptable objects. Now we can see our knockback configuration shows up on our property drawer. 
It's going to create a shotgun knockback config. 2500 force is going to work well with this weight of enemy. Let's make it be a curve fall off. We'll choose something like this, much like our damage fall off. And again, remember, probably we want this to go out somewhere around the 10 meter range. Now a curve that goes something like this may be more realistic, but for fun, feeling more powerful farther away probably makes it a little bit more fun. Also in this curve editor, make sure to set the maximum value to be one, not zero as you see it right here. Otherwise the knockback effect won't do anything. And of course we also have our max knockback duration, which is something like 0.5 for now and see how that works. Since our enemies are on the enemy layer, we can go to project settings, physics, scroll down to the bottom and see the layer collision matrix. And we want to make sure that our enemies can collide with enemies and any other layer that they may knock something back with. If we were to turn off enemy enemy collision, then whenever we shoot an enemy, they'll just fly through any other enemies because the physics system will ignore any collisions for enemies on the enemy layer. And let's go find some llamas. Okay, we can shoot them off the stairs, make them run into each other. They bounce each other a little bit and they start moving again. That's pretty good. Now we've got a shotgun with very random shots that can knock back an enemy. Probably our power curve might be a little bit aggressive right now for this, but that's okay. You can always tweak these numbers with the scriptable objects. I hope you got a lot of value out of this video and not only learned how to apply knockback with shotguns, which is really cool, but also learned how to extend this system to be able to add any new features that you'd like. You can go through the same process for any new feature. You can see that we start with identifying what we want to do, configuring that in either an existing or a new scriptable object, and maybe also some logic about how to apply that effect in that scriptable object as well. Then use it in the gun scriptable object or any other relevant classes. I had a lot of fun making this video, and if you did too, make sure you've liked and subscribed to help the channel grow, reach more people, and add value to more people. If you feel like you need some Llama Academy merch, I've got a link to the store in the description. You can get yourself some shirts like this or some other cool stuff. You can also click on the affiliate links down in the description to do your asset store or Humble Bundle shopping. You can get Humble Bundle books, games, game dev stuff. All of those work through that link. You can also do join or super thanks right here on YouTube or go to patreon.com slash Academy. You'll get your name up here on the screen and get access to monthly topic polls. At the phenomenal and the tremendous tier, you get access to this super cool exclusive dissolve shader. At the awesome tier, you'll get a shout out at the end of every video like Ivan, Ruin, Iphiobolus, Perry, Mustafa, and Jeromatic. There's also all of these great supporters as well. Thank you all for your support. I am so incredibly grateful.